Okay, thank you very much, uh, Lindy, and thanks for the opportunity of, of being here. The hotspot, if you can call it that, in the United Kingdom at the moment is probably the question of physician-assisted suicide. I say that there's been lots of issues that may be raised later, but I say that because we are in the unique position at the moment of having two bills going through um, the parliaments within the UK, so one in Parliament that would deal with England and Wales and one going through the Scottish Parliament where the powers in respect of criminal law are devolved to the Scottish authorities. There's also been a certain amount of um, judicial activity which if I have time I'll, I'll briefly mention. Um, very briefly, the, the, the um, assisted dying bill which is um, a House of Lords bill, so it's not come from the House of Commons, it's come from the unelected body, the House of Lords. Uh, as, as so often these things do, um, had its second reading uh, in the middle of July this year, uh, which now means that it moves on to the next stage, which is the, is the committee stage, and then there's a report stage, and then there's a third reading stage. Uh, given that the Parliament uh, in uh, London is due to, uh, have it, there's due to be an election in the middle of next year, you can take it as read that this bill will never become law. Uh, if, if for no other reason then it will run out of time. But even if it didn't run out of time, it would still have to get to the House of Commons, where I suspect the sympathies would be significantly different. Very briefly, what the, the law would permit is for someone to make a declaration once they have been diagnosed as terminally ill, and once the doctors are confident, or as confident as they can be, that the life expectancy is no longer than six months. Um, again, I don't know how you know that, but, but that, that is the, the, the terminology in the, in the bill. That that person would be able to make a declaration that would allow them to have an assisted death prescribed by a doctor, with a prescription from a doctor, or in some cases by a nurse, sometimes under um, medical supervision, clinical supervision, um, that would allow them to end their life at a time of their choosing. There's no specific reference in this to the question of suffering, it's really based entirely on the diagnosis of terminal illness and the competence of the individual to make that choice. The Scottish Bill is different um, in some ways in that it does actually require, well it's different in two ways. One is it requires either a diagnosis of terminal illness or a diagnosis of a progressive untreatable condition. Now that's partly because the woman who inspired this bill and who sadly died just at the end of last year uh, was suffering from uh, Parkinson's disease and a very uh, aggressive form of Parkinson's disease and it was this that first motivated her two years ago, three years ago I think now, to initiate the first draft bill which was, was voted down by the Scottish Parliament and was reintroduced last year by Margot. Um, it will be taken on uh, and there will be a debate in the Scottish Parliament in November uh, following a pu public consultation on the terms of the bill. So it isn't just terminal, it's also pr progressive illness in this case, which in the view of the individual person so diagnosed is un amounts to unbearable suffering. However, that, that sounds more liberal, but if you actually look at the way in which this would be implemented, it's really anything but liberal for a number of reasons. One is, to satisfy the conditions of the Act, the person has to make a preliminary declaration, then they have to make a first written declaration which has to be approved by two doctors, then they have to make a second written declaration after a certain period of time, which again has to be approved by two doctors. And then, and this I find extremely bizarre, if the prescription is provided, they have to use it within 14 days. Mm. <laughs> now, if you think about the experience in Oregon, where we know that people have... That's it, I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> I was just getting to the end. I know you <laughs> You'll have more time. Thank you, Sheila. That's the first person that needed the bell. That's difficult. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jocelyn. Has it? Oh my goodness. Okay. So um, it's a truly exciting time in Canada. We've got things going on on all four streams of this conference, but I'm going to focus on uh, euthanasia-assisted suicide. There are three main uh, initiatives to be aware of. The first is the Carter case. Uh, that's the case involving Kay Carter, and then because she was dead, actually brought on Gloria Taylor, who um, was alive at the time, to have the face of the case moving forward. Both of these women had degenerative conditions, 
and they were arguing that the criminal code prohibitions in Canada against assisted suicide and voluntary euthanasia violated their charter rights. We have a charter of rights and freedoms. And they argued that it violated their equality rights because if they were not disabled, they would be able to commit suicide. They needed the help. And it also violated what we have, which is the right to life, liberty, security of the person, and the right not to be deprived of those except in accordance with the principles of fundamental justice. So think about it as life, liberty, and security of the person. And uh, we uh, took this case in BC, got a really phenomenal judge. He's a former dean of law, uh, constitutional law scholar. So the, the case was actually in very good hands, which is, uh, I think, important, especially given the nature of the evidence that had to be put before her. Voluminous amount of empirical evidence was put in front of Justice Lynn Smith, and she handled it beautifully. So Justice Smith found that, um, the, that Gloria Taylor's rights, Kay Carter's rights, were violated. Uh, she found an equality violation, a Section 7, so the life, liberty, and security of the person violation, and found it wasn't saved under the provision of our charter, which allows the government to actually defend a violation of rights, and sometimes those can, those can be allowed to stand, but she said no. So she struck down the law. Of course, she gave the government some time. She said, you have 12 months to get your ducks in a row, uh, and uh, off we went. Um, of course, right away, this was appealed to the Court of Appeal. Uh, at, um, at that point, uh, t by a two-to-one margin, the Court of Appeal re um, allowed the appeal, and, but it was on the grounds of stare decisis. It was on the grounds that this case, this issue has already been decided by the Supreme Court of Canada. You, trial judge, you're not allowed to overturn the Supreme Court of Canada, so your hands are tied. You shouldn't have made any decision. Stare decisis, no, you can't, you can't go there. I don't know what I just dropped. Um, it's really important to know that it was on that, it was not on the merits of the arguments around the rights. And it's also important to note that the facts are basically locked at this stage. And so the fact that Justice Smith found there's no evidence of a slippery slope, there's not a harmful impact on palliative care, that vulnerable per people can be, permit, can be protected through a restricted, regulated regime but that is permissive of some, she made all those findings of fact and they're critically important. That case is going to the Supreme Court of Canada uh, mid-October. So maybe a decision that's not. <laughs> <laughs> the adjudicator's decision is final. You'll get another turn. Okay. Well, there you go. We're going to the Supreme Court of Canada. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'm, I'm, okay. so I'm the United States, appropriately next to Canada and in the center of the world here. Um, <laughs> my, my flash point is the determination of death by neurological criteria. But let me start with a contrast. We heard from Jocelyn earlier about the legal uncertainty about whether clinicians uh, can stop treatment without consent in, in Canada and in the United States. Many contrast this uncertainty with the bright line situation of total brain failure, sometimes referred to as brain death. After all, for three decades, this has been settled, right? Total brain failure has been a diagnosis on which death can be pronounced. But recent high profile Court cases have created uncertainty. And typically, these are cases in which the patient is a child, clinicians have determined death on neurological criteria, but the family objects to stopping physiological support. And US clinicians are increasingly unsure about what to do. This month, the Cleveland Clinic will, will be publishing a review showing how it struggled to handle these disputes over the last couple years and other hospitals are seeing the same thing. For 30 years, the determination of death on neurological criteria has been legally established as death in all US jurisdictions, and in fact, in most developed countries on Earth. It's supported by a durable worldwide consensus. So it was a surprise and a shock that it's one of this year's flashpoints. Many in the United States use the, the word reignited because the determination of death by neuro neurological criteria has never been free of controversy and criticism. While well settled, it remains persistently unresolved. Many find it seriously problematic because the bodies of people determined dead by neuro neurological criteria still do many of the things that living bodies do. As we heard yesterday, heal wounds, fight infections, mount a stress response, and even gestate a fetus. And these arguments have been acknowledged but not deemed weighty enough to change the status quo. It's too ingrained to abandon. But we see three legal changes happening now. First, there's a big push to accommodate religious objections. 
California, New Jersey, and New York require hospitals to continue physiological support when families object. But the call for accommodation grows louder. Second, we may see a national standard because death by neurological bacteria is defined as cessation of all functions of the entire brain, including the brainstem. But how it's measured, states differ on the number of physicians, the qualifications of those physicians, the types of tests performed, and how those tests are administered. A national standard would impose much needed uniformity. And third, US clinicians are very, very risk averse. And so we're probably also going to see, even though it's totally unnecessary, more explicit legal safe harbor immunity. Statutes explicitly confirming that once a patient is dead, physiological support may be stopped. Thank you. Colin. So I'm, uh, as you probably guess from the accent, I'm from New Zealand. Um, <laughs> I, I would have to say ki Kiwis are far too laid back to have flashpoints. And if, <laughs> if you've ever been to Dunedin, there are precious few hotspots. But there have been a couple of developments of some interest. Uh, we also had an attempt to, to legislate on the basis of assisted dying um, and uh, euthanasia. Uh, the bill was called the End of Life Choice Bill. It was proposed by an opposition MP. And uh, the only thing that's of interest there is it has been withdrawn from the member's bill ballot. The, the reason being that this is an election year in New Zealand and mm. under pressure from her own caucus, this was seen as a potentially divisive vote losing issue. Um, it, it has been withdrawn from the ballot. Now, given that New Zealand has a general election of every 25 minutes, um, <laughs> you might think this creates a very narrow window of opportunity for introducing not only this, but, but any really potentially divisive legislation. The second matter of interest that relates to something Jocelyn was talking about earlier, um, and criminal, whoops, the criminal law um, duty to provide the necessaries of life, which has actually been changed very recently, it now just says the necessaries. Um, so it's not only life prolonging measures, it can be other kinds of health and, and, and welfare provisions too. But the two interesting cases in that, none of them interestingly involving doctors or healthcare workers, but, but of relevance, I think, in those contexts. The first one, the Quinn case involved, that's a horrible case, it involved a, a woman who had care of her elderly dependent mother um, and who neglected her mother very, very badly and she ended up in a, a horrendous physical state, uh, untreated <laughs> ulcers and uh, uh, seriously dehydrated and malnourished. Um, it was interesting from the legal point of view is her defense in that case was that her mother had declined her offer to summon medical assistance. And she has a right to do that under New Zealand law, section 11 of the Bill of Rights Act. The Crown case in court was that doesn't matter. If you have care of a vulnerable adult, you still have an obligation to, to, to provide the necessaries regardless of their refusal. So we all watched with great interest to see what the judge would say. The judge said was, I'm going to dodge that one completely because I just don't believe the defendant's version of events. I don't believe that she, in fact, refused treatment. And we can see this from her reaction when medical help finally was summoned by someone else. She was delighted and she was relieved. So I don't believe that version of events. I don't have to answer the legal question. Much more recently, not long before I left, we had a case wonderfully named All Means All. Um, this is a guy, his name was originally called um, Mark Theory. He changed his name, legally changed his name to All Means All um, as part of a protest against the government. He said they've done him wrong in some kind of fabulous way. Um, and he, uh, not content with doing that, issued death threats against our Prime Minister, went to prison for a while, and sought to, uh, sought to undertake a hunger strike to protest his dire plight. The issue here was that the prison authorities, who also have a legal, slightly different basis for legal obligation under the Corrections Act, but it functions in much the same way, they went to court asking one of two things. Can you either please give us the right to force feed them, or just reassure us that we have a lawful excuse if we don't? And the court did the latter. Uh, they, they have, for an interesting way they've done it, they've distinguished between a hunger strike and a suicide attempt. The court mm. has said, if that had been a suicide attempt, you may be in a different position. But the intent of Mr. Fe sorry, Mr. All Means All um, is actually not to die. He doesn't want to die. Uh, he, he's seeking to do something else, and he has a right to do that something else. In actual fact, this hunger strike lasted a bit 12 minutes, and all was fine. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Colin. Ben. I'm going to talk about two hot spots, but I'll do so reasonably quickly. The first is voluntary euthanasia and assisted suicide. Uh, 21 years ago, we had our first bill to seek to change the law, and there have been 50 since. 
all but one have uh, failed. The one I'm talking about, of course, was the bill in, in uh, Northern Territory. Um, all states and territories, except for Queensland, have attempted to change the law in this area. And we've charted um, the, the rate at which bills are being brought forth. And there's a definite upward trend, which is significant when you think that the Commonwealth has taken away the power of the ACT in the Northern Territory to legislate. So there was a lot of activity there pre that Commonwealth bill. So now instead of eight states or territories, there are six who are able to bring forth bills, and yet the activity is increasing. Um, the usual model uh, adopted is, is that based on, on, on Europe, but I think it's probably fair to say as people over time think, look, this didn't get up, we'll just try and make it tighter and narrower. So what we're seeing is increasingly tighter, more prescriptive safeguards with a view to trying to gather sufficient consensus to get through. Uh, in terms of where that's likely to end up, I think um, reform at some stage is inevitable. Um, we've had some reasonably close margins. Tasmania was 11 to 13. So I think the question, and I know there's different views, and we heard some different views last night, uh, I think the question is not if, uh, but when. The second uh, flashpoint I'll, I'll talk about is the issue of futility. And we know that's all a contested term. We've heard some discussion about that this afternoon. But there is increasing debate uh, in Australia on this. Uh, in the law space uh, and in the satchel, you've got a couple of papers, including one that Jocelyn spoke about uh, before. So there's been some discussion in the, in the legal literature. In the health and medical literature, the MGA did, did a piece on this, uh, a forum on this a, uh, about a year ago, and there's been some more recent discussion. And likewise, in the bioethical uh, field as well, the Journal of Bioethical Inquiry, which is based in Australasia, has also carried a forum as well. So there's lots and lots of discussion in the literature. That's also happening in the policy setting as well. Uh, in the last month, there have been two major uh, forums sponsored, sponsored by at the state level um, to try and talk about this particular issue. And again, we're hearing clinicians talk about it all the time. So it's live in literature and the policy and also at the coalface as well. Uh, if I had to summarise the sort of two big ticket items, and these are necessarily generalisations, I think step one is, is people are saying, and the literature is saying, uh, this is a problem, we have to stop it. Uh, and step two is th this growing sort of thinking about who should decide and on what criteria. And initially there was a lot of discussion which sort of centred around clinical leadership and medical decision making, but there's other voices that are c coming through as well and, and that, that is being challenged uh, and, and that discussion is likely to continue as well. Uh, and a part of that is, is the Queensland law, which uh, as we've heard is different from other parts of the country where we're talking about adults who lack decision making capacity, uh, consent is required to withhold or withdraw life sustaining treatment. Thank you. Okay, folks, the first uh, round of questions, and they're coming through pretty thick and fast, so thank you. Uh, keep them coming. And Jocelyn, because I, I accidentally may have cut you short a little, because <laughs> I didn't have my stopwatch at that stage and I was just guessing. Um, <laughs> I, I had no go. I can see that. I'm busted. Anyway, the first question <laughs> is to you. Um, so. <laughs> no, no, you weren't. All right. Okay. You spoke this afternoon about society making resource allocation decisions. Do you think it would, would help legislative change to occur in Australia if we had a group like the UK's NICE, National Centre for Health and Clinical Excellence, which has a mandate to decide what therapies can be provided by NHS and gives politicians something to hide behind rather than being the bad guys themselves? I think an entity like that, I don't know about how well that's working in reality, but the concept of an entity that is arm's length from government but has the accountability back to government is really good in this kind of environment. Not so that the politicians can hide, I'm not that sympathetic to them, um, but rather because that is the way that you can get the appropriate expertise at the table for making those decisions because when I, I mentioned before, I think you need a whole range of stakeholders and those who are impacted by any policy that you're making and that's not sitting in your House of Parliament. That group is not there. So get your expertise through an independent arm's length body but your accountability back to Parliament. So, okay. yeah. Thank you. Can I just add something? I'm Please. Um, uh, yes, uh, well, the, the, the thing that you need to say about NICE is that most people say that's a complete misnomer for uh, <laughs> this organisation um, and I, I think if it, if it does benefit, I, I take Jocelyn's point entirely about the independent uh, decision makers but I would implore you if those of you in other countries think that this is a good idea that you do not staff it with health economists. <laughs> Thank you. Um, we've got a cluster of questions about this topic of futility so we might just uh, stick with those for a minute. Um, 
Colin, to you, um, in New Zealand, New Zealand, you have the Code of Health and Disability Services Consumers' Rights. Does this assist in the resolution of disputes that arise in relation to withholding and withdrawing uh, treatment? Probably not. Um, the big difference about, about New Zealand from the other jurisdictions here, of course, is we don't really have a negligence-based system. We have a no-fault-based compens compensation system. Um, so I guess from the point of view of a fear of a, a potential negligence action arising, that, that's taken out of the picture. But what we have seen in the kind of cases that have arisen, there's still a great deal of concern about possible criminal implications um, around withdrawing treatment. And that's why the kind of cases we have, have have ended up having to go to court. We don't have very many, to be honest. Um, but it, no, the, the, the absence of a possibility of um, a litigation response hasn't removed the legal fear altogether and we've still had to go down the, the court route. We've ended up, I think as Jocelyn suggested earlier, with some slightly muddled jurisprudence in this that isn't entirely clear about things like, for example, the requirement to consult with the family, with judges kind of not quite contradicting each other because we're too kiwi for that, but <laughs> finding ways to kind of say, well, I think what you actually meant was. Um, so no, there's still uncertainty, there's still fears about what might, might follow from it. Uh, the HDC, I don't think, is taking that out of the picture. Thank you. Thank you, Colin. Um, and Thad, the Texas Advanced Directives Act 1999 implements a procedural approach to resolving futility. This legislation has received both good and adverse reviews. Can you comment on whether you see this as a useful way to resolve disputes? So there's a consensus, a, a large consensus, that a procedural approach is the right way to go. Right, and so <clears throat> that's, that's what the American Medical Association came up with. That's what a lot of other professional medical associations came up with. So at one level, this is a procedural approach, um, which it doesn't define anything about when care is or is not medically appropriate. Um, but I think now there's a widespread view among, even, even in, among intensivists in the United States, that the Texas Advanced Directives Act lacks one of the attributes that Jocelyn pointed out, which is procedural fairness. Um, and the reason is, is because at the end of the day, after you go through all these steps and you meet with the ethics committee and you meet with consultants and you do all these steps, at the end of the day, um, the hospital has the power to decide this dispute and, and just to stop treatment. And it's not reviewable in the courts of Texas or in the federal courts in the United States. It's not reviewable anywhere. Um, and so since the hospital is the judge in, a mat in its own matter, in a matter to which it's a party, that violates a serious uh, aspect of procedural due process. Um, and so the, the concept is good, and maybe if you just tinkered with it and allowed appellate review, or made the ethics committee somewhat more independent of the hospital, or at least mandated some level of community representative, community, rep community representation on the ethics committee, so it's not entirely comprised of insiders, um, you, you could mm. remedy some of these things. But mm. as it is right now, mm. um, it, it gives clinicians in Texas hospitals what they want, which is they don't have to treat a patient in their ICU they don't want to treat. So that's the good side. The bad side is it's, it's really just too unfair. Mm. Thank you. And to round off this discussion well, I've just received a text directed <laughs> to you, Ben. Um, futility arguments are essential if we are going to manage resources. Why are cost implications not discussed? How can this be changed? And I might add a little question of my own. Um, what, uh, how, how do resource implications factor into the, the legal decisions on when, when these matters do go to court in the rare occasions? Yeah, look, I think it depends on, on how you define futility. And, and one of the, the things that if you're being sort of careful and I think rigorous about it is, is that I think resource allocation doesn't have a role in, in deciding what, what counts as, as futile. I think sometimes those issues sort of get mixed up and people say, oh, we, we can't, you know, change the way we deal with this because of resources. But I think those are conceptually different issues. And so I think it's important to keep them different conceptually. Uh, if we think about, for example, you know, unwanted treatment that isn't going to help a patient that you know, they're refusing. I mean, there's obviously resource implications for that. So, I mean, I think doing better at that is one way to try and tackle some of those issues. Um, in terms of what the, the law says on, on resources, I mean, generally in Australia, it's been very shy at engaging with uh, those sorts of issues. They're very much focused on best interest of the particular patient. And they've sometimes said, you know, look, we're, we're going to assume there's unlimited resources and not particularly engaged with that. Uh, look, just a final comment I, I might make is that uh, in, in a study that with Lindy and, and others, uh, we are looking at how doctors talk about futility. Uh, 
Um, and it was interesting to see, and it, this was a sort of qualitative uh, study, so it's a self-selected group to some extent, but it was 96 doctors from a range of specialties, so it's a large cohort. Uh, and the issue of resources did not really feature at all when talking about how they defined futility. So they talked about the cost of futile treatment as being a problem, sure, but in terms of sort of conceptualising is this treatment futile, uh, it was interesting to note that not only conceptually, which I think is important, but actually in, in practice the doctors at least we spoke to uh, were very clear that, that um, when they were talking about what futility meant, um, they, they were looking at the patient rather than thinking about resources. Can Thank I? you. Yes, please. Just, just quickly, I, I would just note in the United States, we actually just recently in the last year <laughs> have switched to talking more about resources in the context of futility disputes. And, and that's because it's been better documented now that um, sometimes the ICU becomes full, right? And then you recognize that there are when some of the patients in the ICU are receiving what the clinician believes is futile care. The consequence of that is now you have other patients in your hospital's emergency department who could benefit, who have a good prospect to benefit from ICU care, but there's no space. Or there's, uh, if you're like a large academic medical center, there's a patient at a referring hospital who again could benefit from being in the ICU who's going to be deprived of that. And so there are people who um, have good prospects for potential for benefit who are deprived of that benefit um, because we're keeping somebody who's permanently unconscious in that ICU bed. And so to that extent, that discussion is getting a lot more um, currency now because that, that's, that really bothers people. Thanks. I've just got another uh, question in. It's directed to either Ben or Thad, but maybe uh, to you, Ben, in light of um, you mentioned the results of that research. Uh, can futility be defined as any treatment which does not meet the patient's expectations? Well, there's been 20 years of discussion about this. I'm not sure in one to two minutes <laughs> I, I can solve that. Uh, uh, yeah, I know you have a bell. Uh, look, uh, 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 <laughs> Lindy and I work together. I don't want her to take that bell outside this room because I'll be talking <laughs> and she'll start ringing away. So I think I've successfully chewed up 30 seconds of my time. Yeah. <laughs> Um, look, I'm not sure I can take that too much further. I mean, there's been discussion and debate, and, and, and Thad mentioned uh, one of the reasons why uh, the, fa the sort of favoured approach has been to shift to a procedural approach is because you know, clear um, you know, conceptual definitions of, of what counts as, as futile have just been very, very difficult to, to come up with. Uh, in the study that, that, that I've already talked about, um, when talking with those doctors, there was some level of consensus uh, about how they talked about uh, futility at a conceptual level, but it was very, very clear that that was very much in the abstract. And as soon as you started descending to particular clinical decisions, uh, it was very, very clear that, that you know, one doctor would say, and the doctors were saying, it's, look, I think this is futile, but my colleague doesn't. The family does, but the patient doesn't. And so I, I think sort of trying to, 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 come to come up with a sort of clear definition which is operationalizable at the bedside is... is um, uh, yes, people uh, have said it before. <laughs> I was trying to resist, so thank you. Thank you, Ben. Uh, I've got a, another question, uh, withholding and withdrawing. Um, now, I don't know, Sheila, if you might be interested in answering this, it doesn't have a person. Should CPR be opt-in rather than opt-out? Well, yeah, I mean, that would very much depend on the circumstances. I mean, a lot of CPR is administered to a person who isn't actually in a position to answer that question. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> but equally, I, I, think it's, I think it is the case that if there is a genuine situation for an option, um, the answer to the question is not so much whether it should be opting in or opting out, but rather whether or not patients are adequately informed about the success rates uh, or more likely the failure rates of CPR, either in hospitals or outside of hospitals. I say this as a woman whose father was was given CPR after a cardiac arrest in the middle of Princess Street in Edinburgh and survived another 10 years. Um, but his chances in the hospital, would, had he been in a hospital, would not have been high either. So to me, it's, an, it's a question more about what patients would choose if, if they ever were in a position to make a choice based on appropriate information about the likelihood of success. Okay, thank you. Uh, folks, we've got a whole lot of other questions, both in relation to withholding and also a lot coming in about euthanasia. But I might wrap up this, this part of the, the segment in relation to withholding and withdrawing treatment. Does anyone want to have, um, you can have two minutes, which I will time on my phone, uh, a final comment in relation to um, this particular topic, withholding and withdrawing, or futility? Anyone for anyone? No? All right. 
Thank you, folks. Well, let's head over to um, euthanasia. That was commented by most of you in terms of hot topics in your respective uh, jurisdictions. And um, I'm still feeling very guilty for uh, cutting uh, Jocelyn off. And one of the questions... Andy. Andy. <laughs> did I? Yes, I did. I was guessing okay. with you too, <laughs> Sheila. Yes, that's right. <laughs> um, and I have got a question... I have, we'll start off then with a, a question for you, Jocelyn. How do you think the um, Supreme Court of Canada is going to approach the appeal in Carter against the Attorney General? Mm. I do not know what the result will be. I cannot tell you that. I know that, I believe that we will have the Chief Justice uh, on the side writing the decision that says it violates the Charter, that the prohibitions violate the Charter. I can say that with confidence because she wrote that in Rodriguez in 1993, mm -hmm. uh, in the first case that challenged the, the prohibitions. Mm -hmm. And the arguments have become nothing but stronger uh, since then, both in terms of the facts of the world as we know them around the slippery slope argument and the impact on palliative <laughs> care, and in terms of changes in our constitutional law, in our Charter jurisprudence. So, I don't think anybody can predict which way they're going to go. I think we'll get the chief, and I think it will be a, absolutely a split decision. I think it'll probably be a close decision, um, okay. um, but we don't know whether it'll be up or down. Okay, thank you. Um, I've got a couple of uh, comments and, relate, and a related question, so I might, um, I might direct these ones to you, uh, Colin. Um, the first one is um, a comment what is logical about going to the very end of life, which is associated with unrelievable suffering? Some persons would wish to die on the, um, as the sun sets and not go on into the dark night. And a follow-up question, uh, follow question. How should uh, people with dementia be included in voluntary euthanasia? Should it be an option to include in advanced care plans? How do you know if they change their mind later when capacity to, to make or communicate the decision may be lost? But, but maybe deal with the first, question, first comment about unbelievable suffering. And you might want to comment about that in the context of depression, people who may suffer from depression. Oh, right, yeah. Um, this, this was, apologies to anyone who was at my presentation earlier, this is, this is what I was, I was trying to address, the notion that depression is um, invariably or, or almost invariably associated with a diminution of capacity, decision-making capacity, or in fact is inconsistent with um, decision-making capacity. Um, and I was reviewing some evidence that suggested that in actual fact, while there are many things horrible about depression, and we should certainly be trying to tackle it if we can, uh, a very substantial number of depressed people seem to retain quite good cognitive decision making information processing powers and that that kind of um, that kind of assumptions one we want to be a little bit wary of perhaps um, can I say something about the second one as well yes about, please in relation to dementia yeah uh, because that's something that is at the heart of one of the biggest and most divisive I think ethical dilemmas in uh, end of life ethics and it's it's what's called the famous Margot dilemma um, some of you have heard of an elderly woman who uh, is, is kind of blissfully demented. I mean, she doesn't really have much in the sense of a, a, a life plans and continuity of, of, of activity, but she kind of potters around quite happily. She seems to recognize familiar faces and, 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 and at a kind of low level enjoys life. While Mar when Margot was competent, she had a completely different take on life. She was very concerned about independence and dignity and had sought to provide by means of an advanced directive that should she ever find herself in demented Margot state, she should not be kept alive artificially. Um, and the question is, she contracts pneumonia, what do you do? Um, to what extent ought we still to be concerned about the wishes and interests and values of this previous person, if you like, who in a sense is no longer with us? Um, and it's probably the most intractable of the advanced directive dilemmas. It splits every time healthcare practitioners are asked, it splits them right down the middle, uh, about 50-50 in terms of what you would do. So it's not really a question of her changing her mind in any kind of autonomous way because she's beyond that stage. It's a question of her developing different kinds of interests and different kinds of concerns. Maybe not competent autonomous interests, but interests all the same. How do we weigh that against her prior autonomous value-driven kind of interest. I have no answer. I just throw it out there as a <laughs> Thanks, Colin. Maybe I might throw over to you, Jocelyn. This was something that was discussed in, in, a, in a meeting yesterday. Uh, 
do, would you like to comment on this with, with dementia? Yeah, I guess what I do is throw something out too as a, a question rather than the answer, um, which is, or a challenge, which is to say I think you need to answer how arguments about dementia against euthanasia and assisted suicide are not arguments against respecting refusals of treatment in the context of dementia. So it, it often comes as an argument against, you, you can't do advanced directives with dementia for euthanasia and assisted suicide because how do you know what the person wants? She's happy, she's a happy demented case, but they don't actually split on the issue of the refusals. And in law, if, if you've made a valid advanced directive in law in North America, if you've made a valid advanced directive in your state of dementia and you've refused the antibiotics, you will not get those antibiotics. You well, can't be given them, yeah, as, yeah, right? Yeah. And so, but the argument is that in terms of the law with respect to euthanasia assisted suicide, no, no, that's different. And I'm not presuming an answer to the question, how are they different? But I'm saying you have to be able to answer how are they different if you're going to treat them differently. Either you have to then allow it in the context of assisted dying or you have to not allow it anymore in the context of refusals. Yep. Uh, and I would just say there's one other complicating factor with dementia specifically is That's bad. Oh. Oh. So, uh, um, Sometimes, many times, they're not dependent upon any life-sustaining treatment. So they yep. could have the, they're legally allowed to refuse anything, but sometimes they're just literally in a state that there's nothing to refuse. Mm -hmm. So there's a big push in the United States, and there's a case in, in British Columbia now off on appeal, um, where the question is, in an advanced directive, can you refuse oral nutrition and hydration? And, and it's, that's, that's totally unsettled about whether or not that is something um, that you're entitled to refuse. It's, is it part of basic human comfort care that you're just not, it's not part of the bundle of things that you're allowed to refuse in an advanced directive or not. Um, the lower court, the British Columbia Supreme Court actually said, not on the facts of this case because her advanced directive wasn't clear enough, her name was Bargo by the way as well, mm -hmm. um, but, but had it been sufficiently clear, he would have enforced it and, they, and she would have been allowed to have made an advanced decision to dehydrate to death, um, but we'll see on appeal whether or not um, as a matter of law, that's, that's going to be upheld. We have, we have no law in the United States on this. Um, so we're actually, we're hoping the British Columbia gives us some, something to look to. Mm. Thanks, Thad. Um, Sheila, a question to you on this topic. UK courts say it is up to Parliament to decide, but Lord Falconer's bill would not have helped Tony Nicholson. Are the courts abrogating their responsibility? Uh. Well, I don't think they are in, in, in a kind of pure sense because the tradition in UK law is that judges don't make law, that they only interpret law. And there's no kind of American realism in, in, in the way in which we approach these things. Um, on the other hand, they've, when they've said it's really, up to the, it's really up to Parliament to make a decision, they have nonetheless made a decision. Mm -hmm. So in the Tony Bland case, for example, a young man who was in PVS, the judges were quite clear that this really was a job for Parliament to decide whether or not you could remove assisted nutrition and hydration. On the other hand, they said, but nonetheless, in this case, we're going to say that this is lawful to do. But they said, by the way, you, know, you guys need to think about this. And the same is true in the Nicholson case, which is the bit I was coming on to. <laughs> <laughs> Don't do it again. I'm not, I'm not. Okay. <laughs> but you were reaching for the bell. Um, but again, in, in that case, the, 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 the several judges said, look, there, this really is an issue for Parliament. Uh, on the other hand, we nonetheless will engage with the question, and the question was whether or not his Article 8 rights under the, the European Convention on Human Rights, which is, is the right to private and family life or the right to personal integrity and dignity, were actually engaged by the, the court's refusal, the law's refusal to allow him an assisted death. And pretty much all of the judges agreed that Article 8 was engaged. And in fact, two of the judges in the Supreme Court would have issued, would have judged, uh, issued a judgment in Mr. Nicholson's mm. favor, but, bef but five of them said, no, um, it's this is mm. for Parliament to decide. But effectively, therefore, they decided mm. that Mr. Nicholson and the other applicants would not be in a position mm. to get an assisted death. Mm. Thank you, Sheila. Um, ben, a question for you. Uh, do you think Philip Nitschke is helping or hindering <laughs> getting voluntary <laughs> euthanasia legislation through? Look, I think this, this is one that can be uh, looked at in two ways. Uh, on the one hand, I think it can, can lead to, for advocates, it can lead to the marginalisation of the voluntary euthanasia movement. People could say, look, here's, here's a radical who's taking dangerous steps. These are the sorts of concerns that we are frightened of and worried about, and, and, and if this is the direction we're heading. 
uh, then we should steer clear. So there's certainly, I think, one certainly uh, perspective that could be taken on that. The flip side is, uh, and, and for those who are in favour, that they would well argue that, look, this is troubling. It's deeply troubling that we've got people, and they might use words like cowboys and others out there, who are operating outside a regulatory system. If we want to do this safely and properly, and we know it happens, there's a large body of empirical evidence uh, that, that demonstrates this clearly is happening, the best way to do that is to do that in safely through regulation. So I think it, it, it's a double-edged sword and can, can, can be seen in both, uh, both ways. I guess it may depend a little on the way in which the public engages with that. I mean, both of those views, I guess, require some reflection and that public engagement this issue doesn't always <coughs> engage deeply in that. Uh, but if, if there is a, a sort of careful public discourse, I think both of those views uh, could be taken. I understand um, that a number of people who are involved in, in trying to change the law in this area uh, are probably stepping away from Dr Nitschke given the way in which uh, he conducted himself in that last uh, case, which I personally thought was, was very troubling. Um, so I think um, he's a, a big figure in, in the debate, you know, love him or hate him or, or somewhere in between, actually there's probably no one in between, is there, you've got one of those two views. Um, I think his shadow does loom large over the debate and the way in which it'll, it'll go, I think, will depend on how that action is interpreted. Thanks, Ben. Um, this isn't directed to a particular person, so please put your hand up if you want to answer it. If we legislate for voluntary euthanasia or physician-assisted suicide, will doctors be legally obliged to offer this to terminally ill as part of the suite of medical options? If so, how could we train interns for this? Justin? I'll, I'll jump up because it gives me a chance to say something I didn't get to, which is to tell you that we actually now have legalized assisted dying in a part of Canada, which is Quebec. The legislation was passed in June, uh, and it'll take a year or two for implementation, but the legislation has passed. And my link is they <laughs> allowed for conscience uh, on the part of physicians in that legislation, but not institutions. So the institution has an obligation to provide end-of-life care, and end-of-life care is, includes explicitly by definition palliative sedation and euthanasia, but not assisted suicide. Um, so physicians will be able to uh, not participate, but institutions will have to provide end-of-life care. Any other one? Any, anyone else wants to comment on that? Well, I'm mean, just say uh, every all the, the jurisdictions in the United States where assisted suicide it, or aid in dying is legal, um, there's no obligation, right? And there's no prospect in any of the current bills in New Jersey, Massachusetts, right, that any any anybody would ever be required to participate. So the, the debate has never been about that. There's always been, ever since the mid '90s, with, when Oregon started never been a question that somebody would be required to participate. The debate really focuses on whether you're required to at least tell somebody about the option when you present, it. and that's still an open debate. Should you have to tell them about voluntary stopping eating and drinking? Should you have to tell them about all these um, other options as part of informed consent? So it's more the question about disclosure duties than about mm. participation duties. Yeah. Just an additional piece on the education question. Mm -hmm. I think people can look to Belgium and the Netherlands because they have approached the issue of educating physicians for participating in this and they have a suite of programs for that. So there's no need to reinvent the wheel. You can look elsewhere. Thank you. I think we've got time for just one more question before we go to the wrap up. And, and that's to further explore that dementia um, angle and voluntary euthanasia. Um, if it were legal and able to be part of advanced care planning, how would this work practically, given the insidious nature? Refusing a treatment is clearer as there is a clear time point for decision. So I think the point is, when do you decide if it's advanced care planning and a person isn't receiving life-sustaining treatment? Um, there's no clear point. Anyone? Yes, I'll just, uh, it's to ask a question, which is why the presumption that there is a clear time point for a decision with respect to refusal? Because in a number of circumstances, you can envisage that it would be stopping something that could, that the person could live for five more years, but you'd be stopping something that would then result in their death in 14 days. So I question the presumption. There, you're saying when, 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 how can you specify the point in time that's um, right. How can you, in your advanced directive, specify? Yeah, so I would just mention, because, and give me points for this, Ron. Uh, <laughs> uh, so we have a colleague, and he has this, it's, it's actually a pretty good tool. It's called My Way Cards, and 
um, and I think there's maybe 50 of them, and they would have these different pictures and uh, conditions, right? So can you recognize your family? Can you go to the bathroom by yourself? Can you, um, you, know, you know, know the President of the United States? And all, the, all these different things, right? And you can say, if I fail, you know, these 12 things, or if I get a score of less than, you know, 10 out of 50, then that's, that's when you stop uh, mm. feeding me, right? So you, you, you can specify in advance the sorts of conditions under which you would find existence intolerable. And so these cards help you work through and reflect on what those conditions of existence might be. I wonder if the other point being made by that question is from the clinician's perspective who is giving the lethal <laughs> injection, um, once those points are ticked off and they've reached that stage, um, when do they give the injection? Do they, do they, you know, it's a harder point to make than withdrawing treatment, I guess, or, or not starting treatment. I think it may have been that discussion we were having yesterday with Luke uh, Delians, uh, how difficult it might be, specific, especially if it's not very specific time space when, when you come to that point. All right, folks, thank you for all of those um, questions. <clears throat> I think we've come to the final part of this session. <clears throat> we've just 15 minutes now. In the time that remains, I invite the panellists to respond to anything that they would like to out of the issues that have, been, uh, have arisen, or they might want to comment on whether they think that any of the ideas that they've heard today, uh, throughout the, the session today, last night, or in this session, um, may provide food for thought in your own jurisdictions in any of these four areas. So, Sheila, can I Thank start you. with you? Thank you. Uh, the, the thing that I was reflecting on that's come out of this discussion and some of the others as well is the huge differences that there are between countries with written constitutions and countries without written constitutions. The way in which you navigate towards a conclusion is so fundamentally different I'm not suggesting one is better than the other. As a lawyer, it's, it's lovely to think that you've got these constitutional frameworks that you can use to build your platforms and argue, and it may well be that that speeds the process up. I don't know. Um, but as a lawyer also, I'm quite, in, I'm quite entranced by the rather messy way in which we tend to approach things in countries where a constitution is not the... The thing against which you're arguing is not the basis for, for claims. Um, and I, I'm not sure which is easier, but obviously we are more like you guys than we are like Canada and the United States. The, I just wondered one thing on the dementia question, if I may. Um, if John Harris was here, and I'm sorry that he's not, I suspect that his position on that would be that one of the things that makes a, no, a known life, a, a, co a cognizant life valuable, is believing that your wishes will be respected when you're no longer in a position to exert them. And he would use a simple example like, I live a good life in the knowledge that if I've left my property to my children, nobody's got a right to change that mind once I'm no longer thinking about it. And we might want to use that as a model for thinking about even the happy person in dementia, that that person's life is valued in part by them when they are aware of it, by the knowledge that they will be respected when they're no longer in a position to push for their own position. So. Thank you, Sheila. Jocelyn. So just to add w uh, one more initiative that's going on in Canada that you need to know about, um, and that is that there are two bills in the federal parliament um, which would decriminalize euthanasia and assisted suicide, introduced by Stephen Fletcher. Uh, they are private members' bills, so they stand the same chance of becoming law as me making the national soccer team, which is <laughs> nil. Uh, but um, they will, I think, provide a very f strong foundation should we be successful in Carter? Because what happens is if we, if we win in Carter, the law is struck down, the federal government will have a year to get their ducks in a row. There's already a very carefully crafted piece of legislation. First, the permissive, here's the regime, here are the conditions, and the second piece is the commission, the oversight commission, and they're there ready to go in, far, in the federal parliament. So that's quite um, useful and interesting, I think. Um, so we have initiatives. It's interesting to see. We've got initiatives at the legislative level federally, the legislative level provincially, um, and in the courts. And we also actually have things going on. I mean, to pick hotspots for us was hard because every single theme in this conference, there are hotspots in Canada of either legislative reform or cases, core challenges. Um, and, and I don't know, it's, it's a remarkable time to be there uh, and so it's, it's actually really useful to be here and hear what everybody else is doing 
in respect of each of those, but man, end, end of life law, policy, and practice is on fire in Canada. Yeah. Justin, you've got another one minute, 30 seconds to go. <laughs> <laughs> I'm done. <laughs> okay, Fed. So, um, futility, right? We're not getting anywhere um, in terms of uh, futility policy in the United States, right? So this is where what the, the patient wants more treatment, but the clinician is unwilling to provide it. But here's the good news, is that the scope of that problem pales in comparison to a much bigger problem, which is cl clinician-driven over-treatment, right? It's unwanted medical treatment. We have a lot of aggressive end-of-life interventions provided in the United States, not because the surrogates are demanding it, uh, it's because it's being foisted upon them by the clinicians, whether it's in the oncology world, cardiology world, whatever. Um, and that's due partly to just the clinician's philosophy of medicine, um, due in a significant part to fee-for-service incentives. The more you do, the more you make. Um, and partly due to just really bad informed consent, right? Which is the patients, and they do consent. This is, these aren't batteries, right? They're not assaults. But the patients don't understand the really, really slight benefits that these interventions offer relative to the risks. Um, and so ha if they really understood what they were signing up for, they wouldn't be consenting to these interventions. Um, so that actually we are working on. I'm a little bit more optimistic that, that we're gonna move on that. And that's because around, and these estimates are like 20, 30% of US healthcare dollars is just waste, it's fraud. Um, and the federal government wants it back. We, the federal government in the United States pays for most healthcare. Um, and they basically can't afford it, right? We need to go to Iraq and stuff. So we need the, we, we need the money, right? And so we, I mean, no, I'm serious. I mean, maybe this is a little sad. I mean, we send doctors to jail every single day of the week, Monday through Friday in the United States for healthcare fraud, right? It's the, in health law, if you practice, if you're a health law professor, you're a health law lawyer in the United States, fraud is the biggest issue in health law. And, and end of life, since just because of the scope of the dollars, that's a big, big target for everybody. So, and that's bad. I mean, I want to send doctors to you, but um, the, good, the, the idea is that this will provide incentives um, to provide more appropriate care. Thank you, Ted. Come on. I was just thinking about the, uh, oops, the, the kind of logjam with legislation around euthanasia and assisted dying. New Zealand's um, very similar to what I'm hearing about Australia and, and Canada and other jurisdictions in that pretty much every opinion poll ever taken shows a very, very large percentage of the population in favour of some measure or other of reform. And yet politicians will, by and large, go near it. Um, and certainly not in an election year. Um, so I guess what, what I wonder for some time is what's going on with that. And, and one of the things that seems to be going on with that is a kind of perception that it's seen as a vote-losing issue rather than a vote gaining one, that the majority who favour change don't care so much about it that they would actually shift their vote on that basis, whereas the minority who are opposed to it feel, that's, that's, I, I'm not saying this is true, but it seems to be a perception among some politicians. I've also discerned a shift in the kind of nature of the, the debate. When I first started looking at this subject with Sheila uh, about 10 years ago, we were both young, you, um, uh, <laughs> the, the debate was still largely on pretty... Um, it was always a kind of religious sanctity of life type perspective weighed against a liberal choice kind of argument. And that seems to have shifted quite a lot. And it shifted in other issues as well, abortion and, and, and things, where the opposition now seems to be coming in from a different place. It seems to be coming from a kind of vulnerability narrative. That it's all very well for um, empowered, educated, white liberal people to, to demand this, but what about vulnerable populations? What about the demented elderly? What about the depressed? What about um, aboriginal populations? Uh, whose, whose main concern at the moment seems to be getting adequate medical treatment, never mind you know, the, the, rights to, the rights to die. And that shift's been kind of interesting because while these are very important considerations, and, and I think we would all agree they are, I think we need to be a bit careful and, uh, that, that it doesn't end up patronising certain populations, that it doesn't end up cutting the ground out from under um, a respect for their autonomy in the rush to protect them from, it's not even entirely always clear what. So I'll leave it at that for the moment. Thank you, Colin. Uh, look, I'll just say a couple of things. Uh, one, I just might pick up on what Colin said about the, the vote losing issue. Um, there's some research which I won't go into in Australia which suggests, in fact, the opposite may be true. Yeah. So it, it's interesting to see, you know, that's the perception whether that's accurate or not, but there's some research which suggests contrary. 
going last, I think, gives an opportunity to sort of think a little bit more broadly uh, about the sort of discussions we've been having. And I just want to, I guess, pick up on some of the, the comparative pieces. So one of the comparative law discipline involves looking at, at different jurisdictions around the world to see, you know, what's happening and, and with a view to what that can be learnt. Um, so a couple of things to say on that. Uh, one is, one of the great things about comparative law, it provides a great chance to stop and rethink your own values. We live in our own system and we spend all our time sort of, you know, buried into, you know, section 5 sub 3 of the Guardianship and Administration Act. Sometimes you cross the border and look at their uh, section 5 sub 3. But really, you, you spend a lot of time looking in detail at particular laws, particular legislation, particular policy. So one of the great things about a panel like this and the discussions we've had to date and we'll continue to have tomorrow is you get a chance to sort of reflect on your own values and you sort of think things you take for granted. Uh, you sort of stop and think, well, hang on, how could that be? This seems like a reasonably reasonable country across the Pacific and yet they're doing this. And it, it provides an opportunity to, to stop and think about uh, what's going on. Um, the other thing about comparative law is we, we think not only differently in terms of on particular issues, but structurally. And so uh, one issue which I note is, is you know, Australia and Canada and the US are, are federal systems. And some of the interesting sort of dynamics that can play out there, and, and uh, for example, in Quebec, um, they've sought to regulate, because criminal law is regulated federally, I understand, that's right. And so it's been regulated more as a medical services issue um, to deal with sort of constitutional issues and so on. A recent development in Australia is, is a similar move where um, uh, under our constitution the Commonwealth Government has power in relation to medical services. So traditionally the efforts have been at state and territory level, that's where the criminal law I I is regulated. Uh, but there's a bill by the Green Senator, Senator Di Natale, which is before, uh, which actually isn't before the Parliament, it's just an exposure bill, but it's couched in terms of relying on the constitutional power uh, in relation to medical services. So. Federations, or whether that, that, that exists or not, provides an opportunity to think about things in that way. Um, Sheila mentioned written constitution or not, and I think that's significant. And I'd probably go one step further and think, which we've touched on but haven't really drilled down on, is the issue of human rights. So the, the, the four jurisdictions sitting beside me all have human rights instruments uh, in a way that Australia doesn't. We have Victoria and the ACT, which have uh, human rights instruments, but the human rights sort of... Uh, uh, jurisprudence in Australia is very, very slow and, and, and hasn't been driving law in the same way that it has in, in these other, at least to some extent, in, in some of the jurisdictions that we've heard a little bit more about. One of the implications, I think, for us in Australia is to, to think very, very carefully about that. Um, so human rights implications are very, very important. And if we're not confronted to and required to engage with human rights considerations like we might be in other jurisdictions, I think it pays for us to be mindful of them ourselves. For when we're thinking about our deliberations about what law, policy, ethics and practice, etc., should be at the end of life, I think it's really, really important for us to be raising those issues of human rights, to deliberate on what they might require, because we're not actually forced to or mandated to in, in the way that that might occur in other jurisdictions, um, which I think opens a whole lot of other questions which in Australia we haven't yet properly grappled with.